This is episode 31 of the Immunology Podcast, Autoimmune Diseases and B-Cell Immunity with Dr. Mark Schlomchik. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Jason Goldsmith and Dr. Brenda Rao. Welcome back to the Immunology Podcast, where we have conversations with immunologists. The Immunology Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting the life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. Today, we have Dr. Mark Schlomchik from the University of Pittsburgh on the podcast to talk about his research involving systemic autoimmune diseases, long-lived B-cell immunity, and immunopathogenesis. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in immunology news coming up, but first... Are you looking for a quick reference that you can hang on your lab wall? Stem Cell Technologies has various wall charts covering different immunology topics, including a snapshot of COVID-19, an overview of antigen processing and presentation, and more. Explore all of the immunology wall charts and order your free copy at stemcell.com forward slash immunology wall chart. So how many wall charts do you have in your lab, Brenda? Are you, are you just plastered them? Uh, there are a bunch, but the fact is that there's not a lot of sp like empty wall space anywhere in my lab, to be honest. So I have a bunch of them just like folded, waiting for their moment. Very sad. You could put them in your house. Yeah, I could. Technically, I could. Um, I'd rather just hang some art. But well, I guess these flowchars are kind of artistic, aren't they? It's true. Yeah, no, they are. But I do know, I do think the best place to put them is in the, in the, in the toilet stall, you know, like on the, on the door. So then you're, you're there and then you get to see, there's this one, this, we actually have one with the hallmark, no, the, the, the three, uh, what is it? The three, um, uh, how they call it? The three like status of cancer from, oh, from yeah. this, this idea from Robert Shriver. And they're like there, and then you see all of the like evasion, uh, immune, uh, you know, uh, elimination, <laughs> equilibrium yeah. oh, always yeah. learn a new cytokine cascade while yeah know, yeah nature takes its course there you go <laughs> well it's almost summer here and i guess it's the first day which means yeah. it's the longest day of the year how many oh. hours of daylight is that for you I, I don't know exactly but a lot it's like it's like 11 p.m and the like by this time it's 11 p.m. and it's still light outside. I, I love it. It's really, really nice. It's light yeah. at 11 p.m. Oh, that's it's crazy. Not, I, it's like there's still, you know, you, you've you still had the memory of the sun. It's like, it's, there's still, it's not completely dark. Also, well, I know Amsterdam is not completely dark because there's so much light pollution. So maybe I'm not in the best place to tell. Still, still pretty late. You know when the sun goes down. Now that's interesting. My yeah. in-laws are going to be in Alaska right after, <gasps> right after the, uh, yeah. you know, like, like July time. And so it'll still yeah. be like, you know, 20 something hours of daylight Ooh. a day or more, 23 or something That's ridiculous. awesome. We should all go to Finland to celebrate the solstice. There they have go. this huge, you know, it's, it's a free, it's, a, it's a, like a public holiday and people like, they do a huge thing. That I think is probably the biggest part is the, the day, you know, the day that never ends. That's that pretty crazy. literally never ends. It's pretty cool. All right. Well, we should probably talk about some papers here. All right. Do you Let's want do me that. to get the COVID paper out of the way? Well, you know what? I also have a COVID paper. All right. Two COVIDs. And I guess I'll, I'll go first with one here. Um, it's titled Antibody Escape of SARS-CoV-2 Omicron BA4 and BA.5 from Vaccine and BA.1 Serum. <clears throat> it, it appears in Cell. It was received, it accepted on June 3rd. It's still in preprint. First author, I am going to try and pronounce and apologize now for butchering. It's Akachai Tuprakon. And last author is Gavin R. Screeton. So apologies if I didn't get that exactly right. Um, so that being said, the article's pretty straightforward. They take virus or pseudovirus from the most recent sub-variants of Omicron, BA4, BA5. Look at how vaccine and BA1, people who are exposed to Omicron as well, the, the BA1 strain, the original, the OG Omicron, and look at how neutralizing effect you have. They also do mutational analyses. So they sp I, this is an interesting paper in that I think it is in cell because they spend all this time doing antigenic mapping of the mutations and show that, hey, with this mutation and this substrain, you lose binding to these different antibodies and drug products because they also look at monoclonal antibodies and other treatments. 
which are known to bind to that region with a mutation, but that's also super obvious. Like the mutations in this place are absolutely going to jack things up. And some of these mutations that are in Omicron, the new subvariants Omicron were in Delta. And so it's like a, and then we knew those antibodies didn't work in Delta. So the high level point is some of the subvariants of Omicron have mutated enough that they break the neutral, they reduce the neutralizing antibodies even of the first Omicron strain. So you're going to have more recurrent reinfection. And they do a very good job showing structure function mutations of this. So they show that, you know, hey, this mutation in this spot, put this residue here. We've seen this before. Or you'd anticipate that it's going to screw things up. And lo and behold, it screws things up. Um, but the very high level is the subvariants are mutating in such a way, mostly in the spike protein, which is why they're not full variants, right? These are really small subvariant spike protein that affects the angiotensin receptor binding area of the cells or other parts. And in the end demonstrates that um, you uh, the mutations affect neutralizing antibody binding. So I wanted to review this A to see if there's a lot of new there, but there, but there isn't. This is the same story again with another subvariant. And my question to the scientific community starts to become, at what point does this become less and less interesting? Because the virus is always going to mutate. There's all occasional, obviously there's a mutational drift or it's eventually going to start settling because it's going to kind of find its sweet spot. And we're not quite there yet. But it's still just mutating in such a way to be, you know, affect binding to an extent of antibodies. It may also affect binding to the receptor though. And it's just another sub sub mutation. And yeah, every mutation makes it so that some of the neutralizing antibodies don't work, but we think we still have good protection from severe disease, which we see clinically. And you're going to get recurrent infections of COVID. Everyone will because either you lose the antibodies over time, which naturally happens, or the antibodies become less effective over time. Then you get a new subvariant, and so the antibodies kind of work, and you're protected from serious disease, and you get a new batch of antibodies that are even more optimized. Then it mutates again, and this, this is life for all viruses that we are bathed in all the time and we're just really tracking this one and i'm wondering when we should stop really tracking this one because it's starting to become the same story over and over again <laughs> jason thinks boring not again i think that there's you know thinking a little bit outside of the immediate use of this i think it's kind of cool that you end up um maybe this could end up giving you a data set of kind of antibodies and how they react with different protein sequences. And then maybe you can use this in the future to feed it to some model that would let you really well better or better predict how a specific antibody will bind to an antigen. I mean, they already have those models and I don't think anything's being surprised here. You know, the, a residue that went from hydrophobic to hydrophilic or one that went from a small, you know, neutral to a, a large charge. I just said the same thing twice, yeah. but like, like, the, like <laughs> these are known... Oh, this one's making a salt bridge. There's, there's, they're showing yeah. what they think happen is happening. So they're, they're basically saying, yeah, if you do this in silico, this looks like what's going to happen. Lo and behold, it's what happens again. Mm. So you so don't I think don't, it's really, it's re, you think it's really not, not really unbiased. It's more like, well, is what we expect. And here yeah, is I'm not, I'm not surprised. I was not surprised by anything in this paper, mm -hmm. it, but it's confirming things. But it's not like, oh, wow, big new discovery. So I am a little surprised in that cell, except it's COVID. So, of course. Mm. Well, maybe maybe the authors can refute your skepticism in, in, in Twitter. I, mean, if they, I think it's good hear. work. I don't think they I don't think it's bad work or, you know, there's flaws yeah. in it that are significant. I just don't think it's super exciting anymore. Yeah, I guess it's also at some point. Uh, I, I, this just sounds a little bit, I don't know, silly, but it does does get old, just, even though the 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 pandemic is not over and COVID is still, you know, raging. Um, it gets it gets bored, it gets a little bit over re or redundant in a way. Uh, you kind of want to see other things being studied. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I think that's a very human, not necessarily a very good response, but it's a very human thing. Kind of this exhaustion, this fatigue. Well, also, at what point are we gaining significant knowledge from this that's really pushing mm -hmm. the field? In one way, we are, right? We're, we're live tracking of viruses that mutates through us much more than we ever did even with HIV. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so it's really interesting to see that. At the same time, we're maybe spending so much attention that we're freaking people out about the sub sub. We're, we're now remember we used to be talking about variants. Now we're talking about sub variants. Yeah. Like like soon we're going to be teaching people the the protein code so they can talk about you know every single change in variant. You know, yeah. They talk like one L four five two R. So maybe they're going to start talking about that now in, in the news at some point. Like at some point, it seems like we need to be talking about the fact that it's here and it's going to mutate and that's normal biology. All right. So interesting approach, maybe not extraordinary uh, conclusions, but solid work is always yeah. well. Solid work, not surprising work, but solid work. I would say it's not, it wasn't even easy work. It was hard, good work, but okay. did I learn, did I learn something new? Well, yes, and that they demonstrated what we thought was true, but that it field mm -hmm. shift me like most cell papers do. No. Yeah. Okay. So I guess it doesn't get the fresh tomato um, category for you from you. Nope. No, nope, not, not hundred percent certified fresh, not rotten, but okay. not certified fresh. All right. All right. <laughs> Talking about certified fresh, fresh out of uh, the press. Um, my paper also COVID and, um, was published on the 12th of June, so it's quite recent, and uh, published at Cell. First author, Anthony Fernandez Castañeda and Pewin Lu from the labs of uh, Akiko Iwasaki at Yale and Michelle Monji at Stanford. The, the title is Mind Respiratory COVID Can Cause Multilineage Neural Cell and Myelin Dysregulation. And I think the as always, the title is very informative. It gives a lot of way. Um, I thought it was really nice because in this in this work, they tried to look into the neurological consequences of mild, focusing on mild COVID infections uh, that are limited to the lung, uh, but that we know that still people that have mild COVID that don't uh, show uh, severe damage in the lungs or a very severe uh, clinical uh, progression, they still have can have very very uh, severe uh, cognitive and 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 and, and neurological uh, um, consequences. So they are trying to understand how this how this works. So basically, that's what they do. They they study in they have a mouse model in which they they give so they they prepare mice to get COVID. So they. Uh, prepare a mouse model in which they deliver ACE2, so the receptor that COVID binds to, to the trachea and lungs of mice you, using a viral, uh, a viral vector. So because of, otherwise this mice would not be um, would not be susceptible for COVID for COVID uh, infection, and then they 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 infect the mice intranasally with COVID. So actual SARS-CoV-2. So this probably was done in a very secure lab. And what they see in this model that when they do this, the mice, they get sick, but they do mostly fine and they recover. Uh, and when they do uh, lung histopathology, the, mice, the, the lungs of these mice are fine. And this kind of is similar to what you see in mild COVID infections. Um, and then, so they, they try to, to see, uh, under, so look into the inflammatory environment in the brain of these mice. So they measure cytokines, inflammatory cytokines in serum and serial spinal fluid, so CSF. And they see that indeed, after seven days after their infection and even into seven weeks after their infection, there are many inflammatory cytokines that are elevated in the CSF of these mice. And they um, do um, focus on one uh, uh, cytokine, which is CCL11, that remind, really remains high even after seven weeks, uh, while it's normal in serum after this time, it, it still remains high in the brain. And this is something that they've, also has been observed in, 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 the, humans, in the human situation uh, because CCL11 has been associated with limiting neurogenesis and contributing to cognitive impairment. So this, they, this, this particular uh, chemokine really gets their attention. And they see that in these mice again that were that had mild COVID, they see uh, increased microglial reactivity, specifically in the subcortical white matter. So underneath the cortex, 
So not in the gray matter of the cortex, but in the, the, the thing that's underneath that is mostly not the axons of the neurons with all this fat, all this uh, myelin uh, in, this, in this area. And this is something, something that they also see in people that have had, they have access to autopsies of people with, with that did, that died with COVID, but not with severe COVID at the time of death. And these people, despite not showing lung damage, uh, or very little lung damage, they also see activating microglia in this uh, subcortical white matter, like they see in the mice. And and this really gets them to look at a, a, a kind of a whole range of, of, of indicators of inflammation and neuronal um, impairment in, 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 in the mouse models. And they, they do see, um, these do see other, other negative effects uh, including hippocampal a reduce a reduction in hippocampal neurogenesis, so they see problems with the uh, hippocampus of of these mice, and this is something also related to uh, cytokines such as interleukin six and CCL eleven, uh, which in which well Michel Monge actually you know the one of the last authors has a lot of experience and has published a lot on this cytokine inflammation in the brain, so they do see that there's this problems with neurogenesis. And in, in the mouse model, and when they look into my, uh, humans that have uh, cognitive, sim cognitive symptoms after COVID infection, uh, amongst patients that were in infected in the early times of the pandemic, they also see that those patients that, that report brain fog, this COVID brain fog, have higher CC11 uh, levels, and that these levels are elevated mostly in uh, uh, preferentially in patients with a history of autoimmunity, and also men do worse than women. Um, so they show also the CC11 itself, administered interperitoneally in this mice, induces microglia reactivity, specifically in the hippocampus and uh, not in the cortex, like what they see in, their, in the mouse models. So they really try to associate the CC11 the CC level elevated levels with uh, the effects, the neurological effects that they see. They see loss of myelinated, uh, myel myelinating oligodendrocytes, which results in a loss of myelin also. And this is something that they has also been reported for other, another therapy that is known for inducing cognitive uh, fog, which is metatraxid therapy and other chemotherapies for cancer. So they kind of wrap this uh, as, a, as a general effect of the inflammation uh, reaching the brain, and this has an effect on the resident microglia. They compare with, H1, uh, with H1N1 influenza models in, in the mice, which they see that influenza can also increase the inflammation, inflammatory cytokines in the CSF. Slightly different, they see a different uh, profile. But what is interesting, right, they do see CCL11, like they see in SARS-CoV-2, uh, but they see slightly different hippocampal pathology, uh, and uh, so they saw this similar uh, pathology in the hippocampus, but l the effects on the subcortical white matter are less, not as lasting as with COVID, suggesting that there's some differences between the two viral infections in the um, in the in this particular area of the, of the brain and the effect on this area of the brain. So, in conclusion, they 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 do show that even in mild cases where you don't have problems such as a microvascular thrombosis or problems uh, or infection of the brain itself, that's the inflammation from the lungs is sufficient to generate all of these effects on directly on the brain and uh, in the, in the, in the uh, center, uh, nervous system. Did they compare this to other diseases at all, like flu or something? Is this just like if you have enough inflammation in your body, your brain's going to get a little foggy, which is true sometimes. I think people have experienced that with the flu or other things. So they or do have this COVID influenza. Specific. They they compare yeah. with influenza. They have they have see it very similar. Uh, the main differences is that they see that the effects on the subcortical white matter are less lasting and they resolve mostly by the seven weeks, uh, whereas that's not the case when there are SARS-CoV-2 models. For example, and also, also in the introduction, they 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 mentioned that for that it is known that other infection, I know other infectious um, insults can generate inflammation in the brain. For example, LPS, 
or as they say, also inflammation generated from radiation, chemotherapy drugs, uh, that can also result in activation of the microglia in the brain. So they're just saying in this case that COVID seems to last longer, more generally speaking. Yeah, I think that is the the take home message is that this is quite long lasting, um, and that's probably why these people are yeah that relates to the long term effects of 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 these. Uh, but this they infection. don't know the mechanism for it. Interesting. Well, they do say that you have reduction of myelination uh, because you're losing oligodendrocytes. Uh, uh, and you also have problems with the neurogenesis in the hippocampus and you have problems with, with the uh, white matter that that's where all the kind of the, the wiring goes through. So I guess that all of that together generates, yeah. uh, damage in more and more. Um, well, I meant yeah. why COVID is doing it more than other things. No, I don't think they, they, they go into that. Ex yeah. They just show that it seems to be different, but. Other than show that there's this chemokines, particularly CCL11, uh, that activate the microglia specifically, even on its own. So if you administer CCL11 only, that already uh, imitates a lot of the of the of the symptoms, a lot of the effects. Um, but yeah, I guess that uh, they don't go into a lot of details more than that. Interesting though. Very yeah. Tiny. Uh, makes me enjoy the COVID I had even. COVID on the brain, yeah. How is your CC? You should get your CC11 levels checked. Yeah, they're going to have to biopsy me, and that sounds like a terrible idea. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, that's in the serum, I think. They're looking yeah. at CC11 in the serum. Or is it in oh. the CSF? No, I'm not sure, actually. I want an LP. No, Lumbar I understand. Lumbar punctures are not fun. That's terrible. Yeah, mm. don't do it. Uh, okay, moving on right, from COVID. Yeah. Got all that right. done? Still Next. doing infections. Today's an infectious disease day for me. All right. We're going to talk about pregnancy. This one is pregnancy enables Okay, that's not an infection. You do know that, right? It's well, a... I've got to get to the second sentence. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Technically, pregnancy is kind of immunologically an infection. It's a, but... it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a parasite growing inside of you. Technically, yes. But anyway, it's only half you and it's half this other person. Anyway. Pregnancy enables antibody protection against intracellular infection. First author, John J. Erickson, last name author, Sing Sing Wei, published in Nature, June 8th. So this is really cool. So intracellular infections, right? You're not going to cure them with antibodies. Generally speaking, intracellular pathogens are treated by, if you know, innate immune system, yeah, put that aside. Adaptive immune system would be T-cell regulated. Well, we know, and there's been other work done, that, that maternal exposure to an intracellular pathogen pre-pregnancy makes the babies more resistant. And so they model this in listeria in mice. I can't really do this in peoples, unfortunately, because, um, you know, ethics. But what they show, so they, they basically try to figure out why this is, and they figure it out. Spoiler alert. So they take pregnant, they take virgin mice exposed them to listeria and then get them pregnant and then they're really clever and that they'll make the mother a knockout mouse for various things but the father not a knockout mouse and so the children are usually fully functional heterozygotes so you can really sort out what maternal genes pathways things are involved in the process that we're looking at so they walk through this and say oh man so maternal igg transferred from mommy to baby somehow protects against intracellular infections. But that's weird because why are antibodies involved in intracellular infections? That makes no sense, right? Um, so it was maternal B cells were required for this based on knockout mice, not CD8 T cells. So that's really still weird, right? Like something about the maternal B cells pumping out antibodies into the baby eventually makes you resistant. Okay. Um, and then they can take serum from another mom and transfer it into a baby and it still works. But something about the antibody. But they did show and that CD8 mediated immunity was bypassed by pregnancy completely. But that was very weird and they were all confused. So they looked at the IgG and the structural modifications of the IgG quite cleverly. There's different enzymes that will deacetylate or modify different parts of it. And so you can 
determine the rate of that reaction and then determine what was bound, you know, what was there beforehand. Like if the enzyme can't work, it can't consume ATP. If it can't consume ATP, you don't have a color change in a plate. So that was their main method. And then they did mass spec, of course, because you got to do mass spec for this type of thing. So they showed that there is a salicylic acid that's really important for this that's on the antibody, but that it's specifically deacetylated during pregnancy, but not in virgin mice. Okay, that's weird. So that's a thing that happened. And they, they, they find the position. It's not, it's 9-O acetylated, acetylated salicylic acid. But we're just going to say it's the important one here. So I don't have to say that over and over again. So this important residue is deacetylated. They show where it is and it's on the FAB region. Okay. Um, Cause you know, the salicylic acid, the positions relative to the salicylic acid. So they, they, they map this all out and identify it. What they show though, is what's crazy is that they know that acetylation at this site masks the uh, ones that are salicylated Matt are um, mass salicylic ligands for the SIG LEC CDT22, which is primarily expressed in B lymphocytes and blunts their activation. So they, they, their hypothesis was that pregnancy deacetylated IgG stimulates CD2 dependent inhibition of B cells. So they showed that the CD22 cells were B lymphocytes in naive and infected babies, and it was essential. The CD22 was essential for the protection, showing using CD22 mice or neutralized an, or in knockout mice or neutralized antibody. So um, CD22 expression by the B cells was important, which they know is related to this acetylation signaling. And I'm trying to describe this as easily as possible without the, without the triple negative sentence. Essentially what happens is the deacetylated IgG binds to CD22 and suppressed IL-10 production by the B cells. And suppressing IL-10 production in the B cells leads to increased immune activation against intracellular pathogens. So if you deacetylate, those antibodies then react with the CD22 receptor on B cells, and it's necessary and sufficient, that receptor. And that receptor upon activation makes um, B cells produce less IL-10, which then leads to a more robust immune activation, which kills the intracellular pathogens and saves the organism. So pregnancy modifies the antibodies. It's only in pregnancy that it does this to create a IL-10 knockdown, so to speak, signaling in the baby to enhance intracellular pathogen killing. How the hell this evolved, I have no idea. Hmm. And this only applies to, to, ba to the babies while they are in gestation or... Are uh, these antibodies also present in They're present in milk. breast milk, so they're transmitted by wean, you know, okay. until the baby wean. Interesting. Is there, do they, do they at all discuss the, the risk of autoimmunity or like exacerbated immunity? They don't talk about that at all. Hmm. I guess babies are less likely to have autoimmunity because they usually don't have a lot of activated cells uh, no. when they're very young. So probably... They only have mama. Yeah, very interesting. So you're giving them, I guess th that would be the idea. You are reducing some of what is probably very redundant uh, immune uh, dampening, which is probably not necessary for a baby which which has a lot of an, an, an immune system that is quite naive in general. And uh, then you prevent them from this naive system being too weak against uh, intracellular pathogens. Yeah, no, all right. super interesting. Well, another reason to thank your mom for all the things so she's important. done for you. Exactly. All right. So last but not least, um, I have a really interesting paper, but it's one of those papers that I was reading it and I, th I thought already the, the title was quite interesting. And I was, as I was reading it, I thought, 
didn't we know this already? Maybe we do. I have not looked at all the papers doing uh, examining similar things. But I think it's a very cool thing to have in mind when doing, especially when doing mouse um, experiments, because this is very uh, related to the effect of sex of the mice and humans, presumably, on immune responses. So uh, this paper is uh, titled Androgen Receptor Mediated CDATs on Stemness programs uh, drive sex differences in anti-tumor immunity, uh, was published in Immunity on the 13th of June, and first authors Chao Yang and Yingxi Yin from the lab of Liu Fu Deng at Shanghai Jiao Tong University. And in this paper, they take a close look on the effect of, gen of, of sex of these mice on their... Um, immune responses, and they, they, they really focus, zoom in, uh, CD8 uh, stemness uh, in, in tumors on um, male and female mice. So they, we know that uh, the expression of the androgen receptor or androgen receptor is expressed on immune cells and uh, as well as in other cells. And that this expression uh, and the 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 ligands of of the androgen receptor can influence uh, many cells, amongst them immune cells. And there, are, there the authors mention some examples that have uh, suggested that uh, sex specific responses are consequence of uh, exp uh, signaling through this receptor. And um, of course, this receptor is mostly activated in, in males. Uh, for example, you know, some of the, the, the hormone, male hormones that are uh, activated and are binding to this intracellular uh, receptor and influencing transcription. And they want to look closer at the effect of sex in cancer. So they have uh, three mouse models, which they start, and they start their work showing that for all MC38 mouse models, B16, uh, SIY, they have a, uh, an SIY expressing B16 melanoma model, and EIA uh, induced spontaneous hepatocellular carcinoma model. Basically, in all three, they see, they show that the cancer was more aggressive in males, and even in the case of the spontaneous carcinoma model, it was almost only observed in, in mouse that were male, in mice that were male. And they start, they start with this very kind of very strong uh, initial data set, and they say, well, what are the differences that we see in the tumors between these males and females? And although they don't see differences in things such as the innate immune cells, they quickly zero in these T cell populations because they see lower uh, infiltration of CD8s and CD4s in males. And um, interestingly, so. Uh, so they see these differences between males and females. And one of the things they do is that if they deplete CD8s, they see that this reduces the, the, the outcome bias between the two sexes. So they really suggest that this difference is mediated by CD8s. When they look into the CD8 population in, 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 in these tumors, basically what they see is that the CD8s for, mice, for male mice show more signs of exhaustion expression of PD-1, TIM-3, and they have lower expression of, of, uh, um, of genes or, or yeah, of genes that are associated with, these, with uh, what is known as stemness and kind of uh, persistence of CD8 cells. And they mentioned TCF1 and SLAM6. They have less off. And for example, CD8 T cells in females show a higher proliferation as measured by KI67 stain. So they have this, they, they kind of propose that there is a uh, skewage towards a less stem-like phenotype in male mice. And this, of course, has a negative effect on the survival and function of the CD8 uh, tissue populations in the tumor. They have adoptive uh, transfer models in which they have uh, 2C TCR mice that recognize this SIY uh, peptide that they're uh, expressing their B16 melanoma model. And interestingly, if they have they have uh, CD8 T cells that are um, transferred from a male mouse 
Uh, so they, they transfer male and female uh, uh, cells into male mice. And again, they see that the females perform better as therapeutic cells. Uh, and this is, um, and basically, again, they see that these transfer cells have a more terminally exhausted phenotype compared to those from female mice. And this is regardless of the recipient, so either in both in male or female mice. Um, and I also they see that these there's also a lower in vitro stimulation um, was observed from from male CD8 T cells. So it seems to be a very very strong effect uh, of this uh, um, androgen receptor, um, even though. They like the, the way they do the in vitro in vitro culture. They don't. There's no testosterone in the in vitro culture, but this seems to be something that is imprinted on the cells already from the mouse from before. Um, and they see that, for example, long term castration of the mice restores the function of the CD8 T cells from these mice, um, and that um, when they look closer into what is these, the androgen receptor doing in a more genetic level. They do a tax seek to see the, the, the kind of the landscape of, of, um, of the accessibility of the chromatin in, in this, in this, in this uh, CD8 T cells. And they show that specifically there's a lot of differences in the, in the, in the, um, in, in, in the signals that they see from both uh, wild type and I, they have also androgen receptor knockout mice and females versus males. And they see basically that there's some genes of that they see uh, that they uh, get their attention, including the upstream elements of TCF7, which, could, which encodes for TCF1, this protein that is associated with stemness. Um, they see that uh, there's a, there's a, a, a clear signal in, in female mice that is not seen in, ma in male mice, suggesting that it's more accessible in females. And the opposite is seen in other other genes such as digit, EOMES, LAC3, that again that uh, are associated with exhaustion. So this seems like the AR receptor is, in a way, orchestrating this this genetic, uh, the very strong genetic uh, differences in genetic expression. So um, I guess that they also look into uh, some samples from humans, and again they see that CDAs from healthy donors that are male have less CD8 cells in this kind of stem cell memory state and more effector cells. And they also find that in data sets from colorectal carcinoma and melanoma, they also uh, see that the males, the, the CD8 T cells from male patients had more levels of exhaustion uh, than female patients, suggesting that this uh, hormonal signaling really affects the function of CD8 cells. Oh, wow, that's very interesting. I, I always think the the most visible sexual dimorphism in immunity outside of pregnancy is um, man flu, where everyone man flu. So everyone's <laughs> like, oh, men get you know complain so much when they get sick, but apparently men have a greater cytokine response and higher fevers and all this stuff all for right. some reason, and it's actually real. Well, it, it could be that this it could would be consistent with this idea that they maybe they get. Uh, too much activate and therefore they get uh exhausted quicker more uh, quicker i don't know it makes sense to me yeah yeah but no. i mean it makes me think that i mean the result the differences that they find they're quite stark it's like yeah. man this could like this could skew a whole study um i think there's a thing where we don't think enough about dimorphism uh sex, sex uh, dimorphism between uh, mice enough i don't know Oh, and that's interesting. Yeah, no, I think that that sex differences are underappreciated sometimes in these studies. Yeah, yeah, it was very stark. Oh, it was, a, right. it was a very interesting, very that interesting is. read. Very interesting. All right, well, we could keep chatting, but we're going to need to be speaking with Dr. Mark Slumchick here at the University of Pittsburgh. But before we get to that, if you're really enjoying this podcast, we want to make sure you know about the interviews on Stem Cell Technologies website. In the Immunology Profile series, immunologists tell their stories, discuss their research, and voice their thoughts on opinions on current topics in immunology. You can check these out at stemcell.com slash immunoprofiles. Hi, everyone. We are joined today by Dr. Mark Schlumchik. He is a department chair and professor of immunology at the University of Pittsburgh. 
And he has a lab that focuses on systemic autoimmune diseases, uh, long-lived B cell immunity, and immunopathogenesis with a, no, with, an F, with a focus on B cells. Thank you, Mark, so much for joining us today. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you for being here. So I, I think we could maybe just jump into your, your research and your science. Uh, as, as I mentioned, you, you work a lot on, on B cell autoimmunity uh, disorders, uh, like, like lupus, for example. And you actually recently published a paper on JCI looking into mechanisms that uh, promote lupus. And I think it's very, a very interesting story because you found something, uh, used mouse models to, to uh, interrogate specific aspects and you f were surprised by their results. And I think maybe if you would be so kind to talk a little bit about your experience uh, use, uh, studying autoimmune disorders uh, like lupus and maybe use your, uh, your research to explain what do we understand and not understand about uh, these path uh, pathologies? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so lupus is my most longstanding interest. Uh, started when I was a graduate student. I was trying to understand the origins of autoantibodies, like anti-DNA antibodies, for example. And we found that they were clonally expanded and antigen selected. And so we knew that self-antigens were driving uh, those autoreactive B cells, but we didn't really know, you know what the innate immune stimulus really was for a self-antigen. And, and you know, typically we think in say viral immune responses that you're gonna have some kind of pathogen associated molecular pattern. And so uh, really, I guess it was in the uh, late 1990s that Ann Rothstein and I were working on this problem. And we kind of came to the realization that there probably had to be a receptor in, and we thought probably in the B cell for DNA, uh, but we didn't know what that receptor was. And then um, in the early 2000s, uh, we figured out, and I should give Anne really most of the credit for this, uh, that that receptor was probably TLR9. And so this was a kind of big breakthrough uh, in terms of understanding um, how innate, auto, innate immunity could feed into autoimmunity. And eventually we were able to knock out TLR9 and eventually knock out TLR7 in autoimmune mice and show that the whole anti-nuclear antibody response, the anti-DNA and the anti-RNA types of antibodies were dependent on these two um, TLR re receptors. But uh, that's the lead up to the current work where we were trying to figure out uh, where these receptors needed to be expressed in order to drive autoimmunity. And I, I should add one sort of side thing, which is actually not such a side thing. And that is that when we knocked out TLR9, we were expecting disease to get better, but instead it got worse. And uh, many other labs in different lupus models knocked out TLR9. And every time they did it, they actually had mice that had worse disease. They didn't have the anti-DNA, but they had worse disease. But if you knocked out TLR7, then you did get better disease. Or if you knocked out MIDE88, which is the, the common signal transducer downstream of TLR7 and 9, then you got ameliorated disease. So this is, we started calling this the TLR paradox because TLR7 and TLR9 should, in the textbooks, they signal the same. So why should one give you uh, ameliorated disease if you knock out TLR7 and the other gives you worse disease? Uh, and this is really the genesis of the paper that you were, were talking about um, that we published uh, not that long ago in JCI. But uh, what we found first was that if you knock out, so you had to, we had to make flox mice. So we had to make um, genetic knockouts on the lupus prone background, uh, which took some time to figure out, but CRISPR really made it a lot better for us. Um, and so we knocked out TLR9 on the B cell. And we found that that was sufficient to get rid of the anti-DNA, which is what we expected, but that was also sufficient to make disease worse. So there's something going on in the B cell um, that is regulatory. And when you get rid of TLR9, uh, you get worse uh, disease. Now, one of the things that we thought with respect to Rubicon uh, was that um, this phenomenon called LC3-associated phagocytosis or LAP was gonna be a driver of, of, of autoimmunity in the sense that when you couldn't do it, you couldn't get rid of all the sort of DNA garbage of, of dead and dying cells very well. 
And so the immune system couldn't silently clear them and that would lead to autoimmunity. And in fact, Doug Green published a paper in Nature, uh, a series of papers that culminated in one in Nature, which said that that might be true. Um, and so we were knocking out Rubicon um, and trying to understand. Um, so Rubicon is, I should add, is a, an upstream transducer, a starter of the LAP process. It's considered to be um, uh, specific to LAP and not, not involved in autophagy. That was the idea. So, I mean, to make a long story short, when we knocked out Rubicon, instead, we should have gotten worse disease if the theory was correct. But, you know, as usual, we got the opposite result, um, which was that the disease, disease was ameliorated. So Rubicon is playing some kind of role in promoting disease. But we also found that you, did, that you didn't need Rubicon for LAP, which was contrary to what's published. This is a, sort of a major underlying part of our paper, which is that LAP does not depend on Rubicon, and it also doesn't depend on NOx2. And so that's contrary to what's been published uh, by the Green Lab. And we found this, in, and also we, while we were doing this, we found a collaborator, Ann Davidson at North Shore. She was doing very similar experiments, and she found exactly the same thing, that you didn't need these molecules uh, for LAP. So the, that, that kind of throws the field, I think, in a little bit of chaos, because we don't actually know what drives LAP specifically anymore. But we, what we do know is that uh, Rubicon is important uh, for driving autoimmunity. Does this change at all your um, hypothesis regarding the, the actual role of LAP in autoimmunity? Well, not really, actually, because uh, neither of these two molecules, neither uh, Rubicon nor NOx2, so that's, that's part of the NADPH oxidase system that um, is turned on in phagocytes, um, but also turned on in B cells and T cells. Um, neither one of them, uh, it, as far as we can tell, is involved in LAP. So I think it's, it's quite a confused situation, uh, if you ask me. So we, we ruled out those molecules, but we didn't rule out LAP as being important. It still could be uh, that um, appropriately getting rid of dying cells is important. I think there are many other genetic mutations that do support that idea. That's what I was going to get at is, so putting aside that now Rub you can't cross the Rubicon to get to LAP. Um, <laughs> I've probably heard that one before, but if I don't, yeah. <laughs> I, I break my dad joke quota. So I have, yeah, uh, I, I've got plenty of them. You just threw that pun right in my lap. Exactly. There we go. Oh my God. <laughs> Talk about bad puns. So, so, yeah. so to clean up and get back on track here, uh, autophagy and phagocytosis, what you know, I assume then that you've had, you guys have knocked out something else or used drugs or something to show that if you get rid of phagocytosis, which may be a little dirtier and also get into autophagy, then you have worse disease, right? Yeah. So it's not really us. I mean, ma many workers in the field have done things like this. For example, knocking out uh, FC receptors um, is, is important or knocking out um, components of complement that are important in getting rid of clearing dead and dying cells. Um, but I guess most, most particularly, this is a little different, but knocking out uh, certain DNAs that clear, um, that clear DNA that can be extruded from cells uh, definitely leads to uh, exacerbated lupus. That's the work of Boris Rezus and others. So what does Rubicon do? You know, I, I really don't know what Rubicon does. I, there's not that much literature on what Rubicon does. And I think we've all been assuming that we understood it, that it was working in some way upstream of, of linking um, the initial kinases to, uh, to getting LC3 uh, phosphorylated and then into a uh, lab. But it doesn't do that. So I'm not really sure what it does. Now, uh, we did show that. Um, so. NOx2 is the other molecule, this NADPH oxidase. We had shown a number of years ago that um, that molecule is a big regulator of lupus. So if you knock it out, you really get much worse disease. And again, we were trying, we were working on that because this phenomenon called netosis, which is neutrophil extracellular trap osis or death of neutrophils that way or, or extrusion of DNA was supposed to be important in driving lupus. And, and NOx2 is in fact, um, a required element for many types of mitosis. So we thought we would knock that out, ameliorate disease, and then we knocked it out and we got worse disease. 
So Rubicon, what we showed in the paper is that Rubicon and NOx2 do interact with each other. So you get worse disease with knocking out NOx2, just like we published. If you also knock out Rubicon, you ameliorate the disease. And that's different than the genetic circuit that was proposed before our paper. But it says that, it's, that Rubicon is doing something downstream of whatever NOx2 is doing to uh, ameliorate disease. Now, I wish all these issues were solved. Uh, but you know, when you get results that are opposite of what you thought, it, it makes you have to kind of come up with a new set of hypotheses and experiments. And so that's kind of where we are. We are working on what the interactions are with NOx2 and the innate immune system. And we have some information there, but uh, we don't know what Rubicon is. Oh, it sounds like you have plenty of opportunities for more R01s then or other grants. <laughs> Uh, I guess so. I mean, uh, I, I'm very interested in really what the TLRs are doing. I mean, that's really where our main roles are. And this does all intersect with TLRs because, I mean, I'll just give it away. If you knock out NOx2, we had noticed a while ago, you get a lot more anti-RNA type of antibodies. And indeed, the worst disease that you have in the NOx2 knockouts um, is short-circuited if you knock out TLR7 at the same time. So there's a pathway that we're building there that involves NOx2 and then toll-like receptor uh, 7 for driving disease. I just want to say that, yeah, not knowing what Rubicon does is such a waste of an epic name for, for, a, for a protein, but well, uh, I know. It, that's how we, 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 we loved it. I mean, that was my <laughs> MD-PhD, uh, Rachel Gordon's like first project. Uh, it dates back probably about seven or eight years. We were like, okay, let's do Rubicon. I had pictures of all Rubicon stuff, you know, wherever <laughs> I went across the globe, if you saw a Rubicon sign, took a picture of it. So, but we still don't know, but we know what it doesn't do. And that, that is important because I think yeah. that changes the field. It does change the way, it should change the way people think about it. Yeah. I I guess I'm curious, you've been working on lupus for, for, for some time now, and it's such a, it's such a, I would say, such a... A disease that is so so I don't want to say famous, but it's so such an interesting disease, and I think also um, has spurred our understanding of 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 the origins of lupus, of, of what are the, for example, genetic predispositions to lupus, any kind mm. of um, um, environmental uh, uh, um, influences. What is, in your opinion, has been the the biggest uh, improvements in an understanding of autoimmunity? Uh, like like lupus or B cell mediated uh, autoimmunity. Yeah, well, I mean, I you know I was attracted to it for the same reasons because it's sort of fundamental. It's like the disease of the failure of cell tolerance, right? If yeah. you think about like some of the fundamental philosophical issues in the immune system, self non self discrimination is definitely right up there. And here you have a disease where that just fails, and you know try to understand why that is so i mean from my perspective i think that the toll like receptor discovery that i started off with is really really important because uh, it explains why nuclear antigens for one thing are the dominant targets in lupus um, and in many other autoimmune diseases and it also gives us a clue like how you get innate immunity for to get started in autoimmunity so i think that's fundamental uh, b cell driven um, was something that wasn't really, I mean, the, the role of the B cell, I don't think was really clearly shown. Um, we were actually the very first knockout that I made uh, and published in 1994 was a B cell knockout at lupus. And we showed it just completely destroyed disease. There was mice looked just like C mice. There, nothing wrong with them at all. And the main reason for that is the B cells were playing a non-redundant antigen presentation function. It didn't have to do with the antibodies they were making. Those antibodies may or may not be that pathogenic, but the main thing those T cell, those B cells were doing is activating autoreactive T cells. So even though lupus is definitely a B cell disease in a way, uh, it's really the T cells, I think, that are doing the damage when they infiltrate into tissues, like into the interstitium of the kidney or into the skin or into the vessels. So I think that's another important um, insight. But we still have so many things that we don't, really understand about lupus. Like what are the cytokine networks that are driving lupus? I think that's still a bit unresolved. A lot of people have focused on type one interferon, uh, but I'm not sure that that's so specific to lupus and that the clinical drugs that have, have focused on that have some effects, but only mild, relatively mild effects. Partly I think lupus is a heterogeneous disease in people. And I think that makes it tough to understand. 
So I think you hit on a really important theme that we had a couple times in the podcast, which is B cells do more than make antibodies. Um, of the things you've learned that B cells do other than make antibodies, is there one that really shocked you in your in your scientific career? Something like like, oh, I it guess shocked that makes me. Sense. <laughs> yeah, like, but you're like, oh, okay, B cell, thank you for contributing that and breaking really my brain. Impressed you, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I I have to say, I mean, I really did anticipate that they, that antigen presentation was going to be important, and that I think came from looking at some early papers that Charlie Janeway was doing with Mark Mamula, where they were showing in model systems that were not really autoimmunity, that, that B cells could, could present antigen and break tolerance. B cells make cytokines. And I think that's, you know, people have known that for a long time. That's not an insight on my part. But um, I think that maybe the next upcoming thing that we are going to reveal about B cells is how they make inflammatory cytokines and how that can really drive disease uh, and promote, again, promote autoreactive T cells. So, you know, regulatory cytokines, uh, people have looked at that and that's pretty interesting, IL-10 and IL-35. And I think in certain settings, if you knock that out, you do get worse disease. We, we tried knocking that out in our lupus models and it didn't really matter, but I think in some settings it does. But I, I think the part that has not really been looked at carefully enough are, are the role of inflammatory cytokines uh, coming out of the B cells. And you know, I think some labs are getting onto this. Certainly, people know that B cells can make, for example, uh, interferon gamma. Brand Lund uh, just had a nice paper on this, um, and she was really one of the originators of that that idea. They make TNF. They can make IL six. So we're we're hot on trying to figure out, you know, what those roles are. Yeah, you make me think about recent data in, can in the cancer setting that also shows that having B cells correlates with better prognosis, for example, and it might be not just them making antibodies, but probably has to do with them supporting T cell function. In yeah, so tumors. that's really fascinating. I mean, thanks for bringing that up, Brenda, um, because I think there's some very clear data in a number of human cancers, not everyone, but, but breast cancer being a good example, um, and head and neck and cancer being another where the presence of B cells is somehow is a, a good prognostic factor. The question is why? So is that cause? Is that a, is that a mm -hmm. biomarker? Uh, and, or is it some combination of the two things? And, and this is really an area of very active um, of re research. And there's an international um, Zoom meeting that, that's called BC to the third power. Uh, which was started by Dan um, Holler and uh, Tulia Bruno, where they get together, um, I guess, a couple times a month um, and talk about all the research of that. I think it's quite fascinating. Sounds fun. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So to shift gears a little, you've also, like many people, gone the way of biotech um, and founded a company called Blue Sphere. I know you guys are preclinical still. Can you give us kind of the high level of what you guys do and why you decided to jump to the biotech land. Yeah. So um, this is, so basically this is a, a personalized T cell immunotherapy company, which is sort of like the last place I thought I would find myself being after having worked on B cells for whatever, 35 years. Um, and um, what was going on there is that I was looking, I, I did mention how B cells drive autoreactive T cells. And so I was really interested in that problem. And I felt it was really almost embarrassing that we didn't know what the T cells were really seeing, what was driving them. You know, I'd look at these T cells in a lupus kidney and not have any idea like what the self antigens are, unlike the case with the B cells. So I thought we needed a technology to solve that problem. And that's what probably why it was unsolved. And so I came up with a, an approach in which you could capture and functionally express the T cell receptor of an individual cell very quickly and cheaply um, and do it in a high throughput way without ever having to sequence, uh, do any gene synthesis or any kind of traditional cloning. And we call that TC Express. And so as I was kind of discovering that, I was you know, learning from my colleagues around here in Pittsburgh where we do a lot of cancer immunology uh, about neoantigen-driven T cells and cancers, about how you can do adoptive cell therapy. Uh, and I started to realize that this technology that I had invented really so we could understand autoreactive T cell phenotypes 
and, and targets could really be adopted to actually make a therapy for people. So, uh, and that, that was the genesis of the company. So what, what we're trying to do is isolate individual T cells by flow cytometry from patient's tumor. Uh, we, ex we can express like a thousand TCRs costs us, it's about hundred times less expensive, maybe 200 times less expensive than normal ways. It's 10 or 20 times the throughput and about 10 times faster. So it's sort of game changing um, technology. So then we're screening them against the neo predicted neoantigens of the tumor, and that we get from sequencing the tumor. So uh, because sequencing was getting faster and cheaper, all the pieces sort of came together. And I thought, well, this really should be a therapy. We should use this therapeutically. And really, there's no way I could have pursued that through grants and any other means. I had to start a company to do that. So that was really the desire. I'd never started a company before. Um, I was not you know, kind of in that culture, and this was different. But we are, uh, we've really enabled the method and the company is going to the clinic um, in less than a year with a, a variation on that theme where we've used this, this platform, this TCR um, discovery platform to clone T cell receptors for minor histocompatibility antigens. So we're gonna be treating um, bone marrow transplant patients with T cells that should kill leukemia without causing graft versus host disease. Uh, and so company is, um, got about 60 people working for it now. And uh, we've done a couple of, of significant raises. It's expensive to do cell therapy. Let me just leave it at that. <laughs> for sure. I just want to highlight the fact that you co-founded this company with your brother, Warren. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, no, about this family, family business, yeah. science business. <laughs> so my brother is a bone marrow transplant doc. And um, while he was doing his fellowship, he got really interested in the idea that um, adoptive uh, T cell transfers from a donor to a recipient could cause leukemia regression. Sort of the first example of uh, you know, T cell mediated cancer therapy that, that you could prove. And so we, he and I, we started talking. Um, he was not trained as an immunologist. He's completely self-taught. We started talking about how to collaborate on this. And we started doing collaborative work on graft versus host disease and graft versus leukemia. And he, his career sort of burgeoned out. He's one of the leaders, I would say, in the field of graft versus leukemia and graft versus host disease research. And he's now head of the bone marrow transplant um, program here at the University of Pittsburgh. But before that, he finished his fellowship. We published a paper together. He made a lot of great discoveries on antigen presentation, published his very first paper on the field of science. Um, and then I was able to trick the cancer center director at Yale into hiring him um, so that he and I could work together. Uh, and we did uh, a lot of work on graft versus host disease. And then he kind of sort of took over that project. But as I sort of came back around to the idea of doing T cell therapy, it was kind of a natural thing to, to, to work again with, with Warren uh, on this. And he is really leading the, this, this bone marrow transplant part of our company that I was mentioning uh, before. So. Uh, we've been very close um, and consulting on research all the time. We think a lot alike, and it's just it's a it's a ton of fun to work on on these projects with it, especially the company. I mean, that sounds great. I wish my brother was scientifically inclined, but you no, know, he <laughs> he took a different path. But well, it would have been fun. No, but that's, it's very. Really, I think it's such a such a cool story. Uh, I always like to hear about. Uh, siblings that do science, especially when they are working together in a way, it sounds, sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, we've each taken our separate paths. We've worked together some, but um, now this is like a convergence where we're sort of coming back together to work on this, uh, this T cell therapy of cancer, which is really, is I have to say, is really his first passion. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I, I know we could deep dive in this a little bit more, um, but we are running out of time. So it's time for our our final question of the day, which is if you had the ability to uncover one paper's worth of discoveries to solve any single question in science, doesn't matter the field, any field, and you could just have the answer published with beautiful data that everyone would agree to <laughs> that settles it forever, what would it be? Oh, I would have to say it has to be like, what is the origin of life? Like, how did life get started? 
on earth? I think that's the most philosophical science question. You know, we all get taught like, oh, there's not such thing as abiogenesis, but actually at some point there had to be. Um, so where did, you know, is, was it an RNA, RNA origin? If somebody, I, I know this is an unsolvable problem in a way, but uh, many people have worked on it. But I, that's the thing I would love to know is where is where did it all get started? Like, how did you get the first cell or the first, what, what is the first definition of life? So the synthetic life paper. Exactly. Or yeah, in figure exactly. one, it's the self-assembly RNA and by figure five. Right, you know, right, exactly. Yeah, as a, yeah. You've, made a human, soup. you've made a human being by figure five. Exactly. Oh, right, wow. There you go. Maybe I don't know. Maybe it would be just like the nature review. Like, okay, so, you know, that's a really... Thank you for sending in your really nice manuscript that shows the synthetic origins of life. That's a good start. But, you know, can you really show us how, could you synthesize a human being? If you could do that, well, you could get in your paper in nature. <laughs> that's what that's reviewer three <laughs> yeah exactly oh reviewer number three it's yes. like you clearly made a self uh, a self uh, building self but i don't we don't we yeah, think there's a little bit of mechanism is missing yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the way it is it, there's always something more i think that sort of tells you a lot there's always something more you could do in science and I, for me that's why I, I love it um you know every time you think you answered a problem you just really set up the next one Except some of those scientists back in the day where they had those two figure manuscripts, like, oh, here, here's how uh, genetic yeah. information is passed. Have fun. Yeah. Well, here's like, here's the first codon, you know, I mean, talk about a great short paper or the first stop codon, very short oh, yeah. paper. Um, and I think it was in science, but it might've been in nature. Uh, very couple of figures. That's it. Here's your stop codon. No single cell RNA. Yeah. Speak, you right. Know. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But this is the mouse I spent five years generating. It has this phenotype. I'm graduating, so goodbye. Uh, yeah, and then right. now it's like, this is figure panel one of figure five. We made the mouse to test the test our hypothesis. That's me making five it in five weeks. with a CRISPR. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Well, that, that's sort of where we are. I mean, I'm always trying to take genetic approaches to things because I think they give nice, clean answers. But in reality, um, they all, like we were talking about at the beginning with the Rubicon knockout and all that, they oftentimes just, you know, give you an answer, but then open up a whole another set of questions. So, yeah. Little yeah. did you know when you pursued scientists, science, you'd be a mouse breeding expert and that would be your real <laughs> actual job. <laughs> exactly. It's kind of true, though. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming on. It's been a pleasure discussing B cells, uh, the meaning of life, and uh, biotechs, and your uh, yeah. and an awesome yeah. brother biotech. Yeah. Well, maybe we should have called it brother biotech or brother's bio <laughs> or something. I don't know. We go. messed up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, all right. Well, thank you guys. I uh, really had fun talking with you, and thanks for the great questions, and thanks for putting together the podcast. It was a pleasure to have you here. That brings us to the end of our show. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.immunologypodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all of the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at at immunopodcast or via email at info at immunologypodcast.com. The feedback or to suggest guests. See you next time. <laughs>